Good morning, and welcome to our Clean Air Day talk. I'm Chris Lamb, and I'm the president and the CEO of the British Columbia Lung Association. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Slay with Tooth Nations. Uh, it's also really important to me that I acknowledge the 215 Indigenous children uh, who were found in, in an unmarked grave, uh, and also the countless others who have suffered uh, with the same issue. I think it's important for us to recognize that we're accountable uh, for the land and the air that uh, we now, for lack of a better term, share. Uh, so we got to do better by this. Um, Clean Air Day uh, is really one of those opportunities for us to sort of raise awareness about the importance of good air quality uh, and how important air quality is to our health, uh, to our environment, and to the economy. Uh, one of the most dangerous threats to all of this is indeed wood smoke. Uh, today's talk uh, with Dr. Sarah Henderson uh, is going to focus on wildfires and managing through that. Uh, I would be remiss to not acknowledge that any burning of any wood uh, can really lead to dangerous consequences, uh, whether that's in a wood burning appliance or, or in a backyard pit. Uh, the BC Lung Association is committed to doing more on this subject. Today, Dr. Henderson will walk us through the steps that we need to take during wildfire season uh, to protect our lungs and our health. Uh, but first, uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Brower, who will moderate today's session. Uh, Dr. Brower is a professor uh, at UBC in the School of Population and Public Health. Uh, so take it away, Mike. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, again, welcome everybody to Clean Air Day 2021. Hope the air is uh, clean and clear where you are and that you actually have some time uh, to enjoy it today. Um, so before I introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Henderson, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, all the participants are muted. Um, I would ask you, however, to please send in your questions uh, via the Q&A box. You can use the chat to converse amongst yourselves, but we'll preferentially be looking for questions in the Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them there. Uh, a recording of the session will be made available at the BC Long website um, after uh, the session is ended today. Um, if you are posing questions, I would ask you to keep the questions specific, uh, keep them short. Short questions will give us more opportunity to go through more of the questions and please make them questions and not statements. Um, so um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, today. I think uh, she's known to many of you, uh, Dr. Sarah Henderson. Sarah Henderson is an environmental engineer and environmental epidemiologist. She is currently the scientific director of environmental health services at the BC Center for Disease Control, where she leads a program of applied research surveillance in support of evidence-based policy for the province. Sarah is also an associate professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. She has expertise in a wide range of environmental health topics, including extreme weather, radon, food safety, water quality, and air pollution from multiple sources. Today, she, she is gonna be speaking to us on her, her true love, uh, which is the health impacts of wildfire smoke. She's been studying biomass smoke in British Columbia and around the world for more than 15 years. And the title of her presentation today is Preparing for the Worst, Learning to Live with Wildfire Smoke. I'm gonna put in the uh, chat window um, a piece that was just published in the conversation that Sarah wrote um, with the same title and a lot of the flavor of, of the talk today. So that's some uh, written material that you can use uh, to get more information on the topic and more links uh, after, after this. So without further ado, uh, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction, everybody. And thanks for the opportunity to chat with you about this, mostly because it's not about COVID. And uh, my entire life for the past many months, as with many of you, has been about COVID. So really happy to be talking about my one true love. Um, but let's not tell my partner about that. So this is a picture of uh, Surrey last year in that smoke event that we had in September 2020. And I just want to walk you through what I think we should be doing at this point in June to get ready for possible uh, exposures like this again the coming summer. First, I got to get my slides moving. So I want you to go through a bit of a thought exercise with me here. This is the average PM2.5 concentrations across British Columbia from a model that we run at the BCCBC in August 2018. A couple things to note. 
Uh, typically, we would expect most of these values, if it were not smoky out, to be under 10 micrograms per cubic meter, so these light yellow colors. The only place that kind of light yellow is showing up is in Haida Gwaii and the north coast of the province. Everywhere else, we have uh, significantly higher concentrations. If you were sort of in the lower mainland or the greater Victoria region during this period, you know it was pretty smoky. We had 22 days under air quality advisory in the lower mainland. Um, and then what you might not understand is how much smokier it was in other parts of the province. So, you know, this is just really intense wildfire smoke and really intense wildfire smoke for almost a month. If I had told you on June the 2nd of uh, 2018 that this was coming, what would you be doing to prepare for it? If you just knew in August this was gonna happen, what would you be doing to get ready for it? Because that's what we should be doing right now in case this happens again this summer because the probability of it happening again this summer or next summer or the summer after that is extremely high. About this time last year I was starting to think through you know what wildfire smoke and COVID and the combination of those two things meant together and I, I wrote this sentence in in an opinion piece I wrote for the American Journal of Public Health, which is there have been catastrophic wildfires in Western North America during each summer of 2016 through 2019 with no reason to expect anything different in 2020. That was in June of 2020. And this that you see in the left happened in September of 2020. So we were in a position in BC where we didn't actually have a lot of wildfire in the province or indeed in Canada, but we still had one of the most intense smoke events that we've ever had because of fires that were burning in the Western US. Um, and you know, we need to be very cognizant of that. It's not just our wildfire seasons that affect our air quality. It can be the wildfire seasons of anywhere really in North America, depending on what's happening with the meteorology. So I just wanna update this statement and say exactly the same thing, but uh, change the 2019 to 2020 and change the 2020 to 2021. Um, there is every indication that we may have a severe wildfire season in parts of BC this year. It's a lot drier and a lot hotter in some regions. And then there is significant and severe ongoing drought in the US. So I do anticipate that we are going to have another wild wildfire season ahead. I would love to be wrong, but I think we need to prepare for the worst. There's a lot of problems with the scouting organization and I recognize that, but it was also a very large part of my life as a young person. Um, and here I am standing with all of my badges. What I'm not wearing is my sash that is also entirely covered in badges. Uh, and I really like this, this uh, Girl Scouts badge that came out of the Western uh, US and the Cascadia region a few years ago, which is pr preparation for the zombie apocalypse. And, and we have something to learn from this. And it's really be prepared, not scared. What I often find is that when we have smoky conditions, people are very anxious about them and very panicky about them. If we take some time to get prepared before the season comes along, we're going to feel a lot more confident and a lot more capable and self-reliant when these conditions occur. So, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention or an ounce of preparation is, is really what we want to prescribe here. From my perspective, being prepared has kind of these five different elements to it. First of all is understanding what the ambient and indoor air quality impacts of wildfire smoke are. Understanding the health effects and the individuals within the population who are susceptible to those health effects understanding the personal and community interventions that can be effective for protecting people from wildfire expo exposure, knowing where to get good high quality information and communicating effectively. So I'm gonna walk through those five, but hopefully leave lots of time for questions as well, because I know there's lots out there. Uh, a lot of people already sort of pre-submitted questions and I do hope that what I'm gonna say in the following slides addresses a lot of those. So first of all, we need to understand that air pollution from wildfire smoke is really different from air pollution from other sources that we talk about, such as traffic and industry. Uh, when we have a car or we have an industrial facility, those things emit a pretty steady amount of air pollution all the time. Uh, things may go a little wrong every once in a while, but mostly it's actually the meteorological conditions that drive whether or not we're going to have air quality events based on emissions from these sources. Wildfire smoke is different. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know where it's going to happen. And uh, when it happens, it causes air pollution um, of the worst kind that most people are ever going to see in Western North America. 
one key thing about this is that the air pollution is generally transient. Um, so you'll see, you know, when we have these very bad air quality days, there's like this global competition for who has the worst air quality in the world. And generally we're getting compared with, um, you know, highly polluted cities and low and middle income countries. That comparison is not really fair because those highly polluted cities live with that type of air pollution day in and day out, year in and year out. We have really good air quality most of the time, which is fantastic. But when we have these events, the air quality is, you know, significantly degraded for a period of time, days, weeks, sometimes longer. And then we're hopefully going to go back to really good air quality again. This is uh, Vancouver on a normal summer day and Vancouver on a day in September of last year. And again, uh, we remember what this was like if we were in this region at this time, it was really smoky. What I wanna point out yet again is that's really different spatially across the province. So what we're experiencing in the lower mainland region is not what's being experienced in Kamloops and it's not what's being experienced in Prince George. It really depends where the fires are, what the weather is doing, and it can vary um, in space and time quite a lot. So I'm just going to run through three different plots here. Uh, the orange line is the summer of 2020, the green line is the summer of 2018, and the blue line is the summer of 2017. And you can see here that we had these significant smoke events in Vancouver during each of these summers. Um, the magnitude of 2018 was higher than the magnitude of 2020. They all lasted for a few weeks at a time. Now, on the same scale, this is what was happening in Kamloops in each of those years. So in 2020, Kamloops was experiencing about the same amount of smoke that we were experiencing in the Lower Mainland. But then if you look at 2017, you know, we have this huge amount of smoke that lasted just a really long time. And in 2018, uh, also a large uh, amount of smoke didn't last quite as long. Then in Prince George, we see, you know, quite a bit of smoke in the summer of 2017, still some smoke in the summer of 2020, even though they're, you know, quite far north and that smoke was coming up from the south. But there's a uh, much larger amount of smoke in the summer of 2018. So again, just be cognizant of the fact that this is spatially and temporally variable. Even when it's super smoky, we have, you know, these days that are really smoky and then it comes right down again because of the meteorology, because of the fire behavior and then it goes right back up again. So these big changes are very um, indicative of smoke exposures. One of the key things we have to think about is that we, you know, we know that smoke has affected health, but it's not like everybody's going and standing outside and breathing the smoke and getting affected. It's they're getting affected by smoke that comes inside. Most of us spend about 90% of our time indoors, even though I know that sounds very sad. And it's really the fact that the smoke gets inside and can affect us inside that drives a lot of these health effects that we see related to smoke. Smoke getting inside is also a super variable thing. This is work done by Prabhji Barn quite a long time ago, but it's still some of the best evidence that we have available about smoke coming into residential homes. So there's two things happening here. I just want you to focus on these black bars and that's how much smoke got inside from outside um, when there was no filter running in the house. And you can see that, you know, on this end here, it's almost 100%. Uh, the concentrations indoors are almost exactly the same as the concentrations outdoors. And in this home here, it's more like 35%. So, you know, we have this really big range across residences and that's gonna be how much are the doors and windows open? How leaky, you know, is the home? Where is other smoke coming in? So there's a lot of different factors at play here for how much smoke gets indoors into residential environments. The same is true for large um, commercial or other types of buildings. 
What we do find in the literature is that infiltration into large buildings tends to be less than infiltration into residences. So uh, typically for residences, we see an average infiltration of maybe 50, 60, 70%. And typically for large buildings, it's maybe 30, 40, 50%. So there's overlap between them, but bigger buildings do tend to be more protected. This comes from quite recent research we've been doing uh, with Vancouver Coastal Health. We've outfitted a few buildings across the region with low cost sensors, both inside and outside, so we can understand how smoke gets into healthcare facilities. Uh, this is information from GF Strong, which just happened to have the sensors set up two weeks before we got that smoke last September. So we were really able to look at how much smoke was getting into the building. On the top, you can see what was being measured on the rooftop. And in the other three, you can see three of the indoor locations. So a couple of key things. What's being measured on the rooftop comes inside. It gets inside within an hour. There's very little time uh, that it takes for the smoke to penetrate into the building. It is attenuated. We can see that the concentrations indoors are not as high as the concentrations outdoors. And when we looked at days that were kind of typical, we saw the infiltration into these different locations we were measuring was between 18 and 39%. During the smoke episode, it was between 32 and 48%. So it was also really dependent on where in the building, how much smoke there was gonna be. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this when we get into interventions. So now we kind of get to the question of, okay, well, you know, smoke is outside, smoke gets inside. Why does smoke affect health? Um, smoke is a very complex form of air pollution. Again, if we go back to thinking about industry and traffic, those types of air pollution are pretty predictable. We kind of know what comes out of an engine. It comes out at kind of a steady rate. Wildfire smoke is a very different beast. Um, and it depends on the temperature the fire is burning at. It depends on the properties of the fuels. Uh, is it only wildland that is burning or is it an interface fire where we have anthropogenic materials also burning? All of these things add to the complexity of the smoke. In general, it is a complex mixture of gases and very fine particles, and it is dynamic in both space and time. The thing we tend to focus on is those very fine particles, and that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're regulated, so we have lots of measurements of those particles everywhere. Second of all, they're regulated because we know they have impacts on human health um, and we're concerned about them. And what we have is these very fine particles that can penetrate deep into the lungs and cause a couple of different things that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Here in the pink, I want you to note that, you know, a lot of wildfire smoke is these kind of soot balls and they're agglomerations of very small particles. So each of these things um, is a very, very little particle and then they stick together. Uh, and that's important because they have a high surface area to volume ratio. When they get into the body, there's lots of interaction that can happen between the particles and the tissues. Oh, I took it out. Um, I thought I had another slide in here, but I also want to make sure we have lots of time. So when you breathe in smoke, there's a couple of things that happens. These particles uh, elicit an immune response. Your body doesn't want them there and it tries to get them out. Uh, it's not overly successful at doing that. And this can lead to systemic inflammation that affects other organ systems in the body. We're also learning more that some of these really small particles can actually translocate across the lung into the bloodstream and start circulating through the bloodstream. It's not really clear at this point what the effects of that are, but we do know that these particles are going to have direct interaction with other organ systems because of that potential. So, you know, we have, you know, it's a complex thing. There's a lot of stuff going on. We know uh, from the literature that exists to date that some people are more susceptible to smoke exposures than others. And the top of that list is anybody with asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So those kind of pre-existing respiratory conditions. I'd also put anybody who has a um, respiratory infection into that category. So if you have something like influenza or COVID-19 and there's smoke, uh, that smoke's gonna be harder on you than if you didn't have that infection. 
people with heart disease. We're learning that people with diabetes are having a difficult time balancing their insulin uh, when it's smoky outside. People with dementia, again, uh, you know, we think that these small particles probably affect the brain in a couple of different ways and, and mental illness as well. There we have both a physiological impact and the emotional impact of living under really smoky conditions, which is awful. I mean, it's awful for us in Vancouver. Think about, you know, quadrupling uh, those exposures for places like Kamloops or other places in the interior. So, it's, you know, it's really just draining to live under smoky conditions for days and weeks at a time. Older adults whose lung capacity is decreasing as they age, women who are pregnant, I'll talk about more, about, about more about that in a second, infants, children, people working outdoors in marginalized groups. When we do some work to try to sum up what percentage of the population in BC is susceptible to air pollution, uh, the very smallest group we get is 33% if we add up these susceptibilities and if we cast a wider net, it's 66%. So this is not a minority of people, it's a lot of people. Another thing we've learned about smoke, this is the work of uh, Angela Yao, who is a PhD student of Mike and mine. Um, the impacts are immediate. <laughs> so this is one of the best reasons I can think of that we need to plan ahead for smoke because it starts affecting people's health within the first hour of its arrival. This is ambulance dispatches for breathing problems and this is hospital diagnoses of ischemic heart disease. And we can see the biggest impact on this orange line is at hour zero and then it starts to go down from there. So, you know, we really want to be prepared for these events before they occur. We are certainly starting to learn that wildfire smoke has longer lasting effects. So there's these transient effects while it's around, but then it can, you know, affect the health of the population after it disperses as well. This is a study out of the Western US showing that if there was an extreme wildfire season, the following flu season was more extreme than would be anticipated. Obviously this has implications for COVID-19 as well. And we're doing some work that's still in its, its infancy in BC, but what we're really seeing is that after we have a severe season like 2017 or 2018, um, people with especially COPD seem to get knocked down a bit and not recover after that season. So that degenerative condition uh, gets degenerated a little bit faster than it would be if the smoke wasn't there. Fortunately, we do not see that for people with asthma. It seems to be restricted to COPD, but it's a concerning outcome. Uh, this is an area of um, particular concern for me, uh, women who are pregnant and infants who are developing, um, so neonatal infants particularly. This study is out of Davis, California. Uh, they studied a group of rhesus research monkeys that were born into very smoky conditions in California, and they've now followed those monkeys and their offspring. The smoke-exposed monkeys had smaller lungs and smaller lung capacity than the non-exposed monkeys and they had immune dysregulation. What they found now is that immune dysregulation has been passed along genetically to the offspring of the smoke exposed monkeys, uh, although the lung size of the offspring is okay. So indications that these smoke events, when they occur, um, may have longer lasting effects. And if you are in infancy, uh, in utero or neonatal, those effects may last through the life course. So let's get into interventions here, what works, what I can tell you. Uh, front line of intervention, I would say, is portable air cleaners. These things work. And we're going back to this study done by Prabjeet now. And um, the gray lines are the smoke infiltration on days when the portable air cleaners were running. And in most cases, you can see that there was a significant reduction in the amount of smoke that was getting indoors. Um, so what we really recommend is that you have at least one room of your house that you can make kind of a smoke safe haven. You can keep it cool, you can keep it clean, you can seek respite there and um, you can sleep there. So if people are running these folks in their, or these things in their bedrooms, then you're getting sort of eight hours a day of protection, assuming that you are getting enough sleep, which I do not. 
portable air cleaners may not be an affordable or available technology for everybody and we recognize that. Uh, there's been sort of talk about uh, strapping a filter to a box fan and using that instead it seems like a pretty good idea. I mean, it seems reasonable, but it's not something that we were ready to recommend without evidence uh, either in the peer reviewed literature or that we had developed ourselves. And there's very little on this in the peer review literature, though a great paper came out a couple of weeks ago. So when things got shut down by COVID last year, uh, we were able to partner with Chris Carlston and try these box fan air filters in his air pollution exposure booth, which runs on a diesel engine. And uh, we found a couple of important things. First of all, that a good high quality filter strapped to a box fan can do a pretty good job of reducing PM 2.5 concentration. So here we were holding the booth at 300 micrograms per meter cubed, but with this thing running on medium speed, we were able to reduce those concentrations down quite a bit. Uh, medium speed is important. We found that high speed just blew the air pollution around, although this was a small booth. The other important finding was that we were monitoring the temperature of the motor and the temperature of the motor does go up with a fan attached. A box fan is not designed to do this. So there is you know, a little bit of concern about the safety risk um, when we have motors potentially overheating in units like this. And we've just published a fact sheet on how we think people can use these safely. Big buildings are a different story. Every single big building needs to have a smoke readiness plan. It's just uh, how things go. Every big building with HVAC and air handling units operates a little bit differently. And uh, those plans need to be customized to the building. Even so, uh, ASHRAE, the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and uh, Air Conditioning Engineers has turned their eye to this problem and is developing guidelines. Uh, for commercial buildings and wildfire smoke. I'm lucky enough to be on that committee. And we know guideline development by ASHRAE is a, a multi-year process usually. We knew it was gonna take a while. We did get an, uh, a sort of interim document out last year um, so that people can start getting the information they need to do this type of planning well for large buildings. There's a link to it there. You can't really see it though. Masks. I'm just new checking my time here. I think we're doing okay. Um, we've all learned a lot about masks in the past uh, 18 or 16 months, I guess, and and some of that's really useful to the question of wildfire smoke. So first of all, a well-fitted respirator uh, provides effective protection from the fine particulate matter in wildfire smoke. Um, when I say well fitted, I mean that the air that is inhaled must go through the material of the mask. It can't go around the material of the mask. If it goes around, it is not getting filtered. So fit is the most important thing when it comes to how well one of these masks can work for you. But we're also in a situation where we've got all kinds of these masks now on the market and we didn't have that before. So KN95s, KF94s, N95s, all these number and letter combinations indicate that different standards have been used to test the mask, but they will all work quite effectively for PM2.5 and wildfire smoke. Then we get down to the question of other types of masks. Are they effective? Are they not effective? And there's quite a bit of debate about this, but I'm gonna give you kind of my opinion on it. And I've read this literature a lot and quite carefully. Um, if you are wearing a three layer disposable or cloth mask and it is well fitted, the, the air is passing through the material of the mask and not around it, it can offer quite effective protection. In some cases, that protection can start to approach the protection offered by respirator style masks. And that really is going to come down to the materials that are used and the fit. Um, so three layers is important. Three layers of different materials is important. That's always going to be the case with your disposable type masks. If you're wearing a cloth mask, what they have found in this paper here talks about it is combining cotton with something like silk works well because silk has a little bit of electrostatic property that helps to catch the particles as they come through the material. I can't say this enough. Air has to pass through the mask, not around the mask. A mask cannot be effective when the air is passing around it. Um, and air does not like to go through filters. It does try to take the path of least resistance. So you do have to put effort into th getting things well fitted. 
unfortunately, a lot of the advice that's been developed for COVID is also super applicable for wildfire smoke. Um, there's, this is from the US CDC, and this is giving tips and tricks about how to get a better fit. Um, having a nose wire or actually have a, a plastic clip um, to keep my glasses from fogging up, but that actually makes my mask fit real a lot better. That's why my mask, my glasses don't fog up because the air is not coming out from under my eyes. You can use a mask fitter or a mask brace. You can layer your masks, a disposable mask, mask under a cloth mask, and then you can tie your ear loops of your disposable mask in a better way and tuck those edges in so that it fits really nicely around your face. All of these things will help improve the filtration of your mask for wildfire smoke as well. I just want to go back to this point, like 50%, you know, it's not as high as 90%, but it's better than 0%. So um, I don't think masks are the solution to wildfire smoke exposure, but when you need to be outside, um, I don't think it's a bad idea to try to wear a well-fitted mask and try to protect yourself, give yourself that little extra bit of protection. Even so, making sure the indoor air is clean is going to provide most of us with the best protection because 90% of our time inside. A few caveats around masks, and, and there are a few. You can't safely sleep in a mask, it's not a good idea. Um, generally, they don't protect against the gases in wildfire smoke, and those gases don't make it inside usually as much as the particles do. Uh, it can be challenging to get a good fit. Uh, there's a little bit of debate around this, but literature definitely suggests that it can affect breathing. Um, especially for folks with limited lung capacity. If you're wearing a mask and you're finding it difficult to breathe or catch your breath, it's probably a better idea to take the mask off than it is to keep wearing it. They're not comfortable to wear for a long period of time. We all know that now, especially when it's hot and it's like summer out there today. Uh, they become ineffective if they're saturated with water or sweat. And then you know, what we don't want is people like strapping on a mask and going for a run because they feel they're entirely protected from the smoke. The better thing would be maybe to jog on a treadmill in a nice clean indoor environment on that day. Ha, I've led myself perfectly into this. One of the um, key pieces of information we can share is take it easy. Uh, when you're at rest, you breathe about six liters of air per minute if you're an average adult. If you're running, that turns into more like 60 liters of air per minute. So exertion and the need to take in more oxygen means that you're taking in more smoke as well. Uh, it's pretty direct correlation. And we put this together just to show what the differences are like if you're exercising in a cleaner indoor air environment versus exercising in you know a smokier outdoor environment. You can see those exposures are quite different. You may be thinking to yourself, wow, this is great information. Where do I get it? I have an answer for you. Um, we have developed several fact sheets on topics like these. Everything in blue has a fact sheet posted on the BCCDC website at that uh, address that you see there. And then the topics in black are ones that we have planned, uh, but they have been somewhat delayed due to the COVID response at the center. Even so, there's just a lot of really good information there for you on wildfire smoke and health, wildfire smoke and air quality and uh, ways to protect yourself from wildfire smoke. I wanna do a couple of plugs for where to get good air quality information. Again, you know, when we have these bad air quality days, the media comes out with these statements. Uh, there's an app out there that compares the air quality to how many cigarettes you're smoking. Like this is just not useful information for folks. We really want people to look for good quality sources of information. If you live outside of the Lower Mainland region, uh, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy offers a subscription service for air quality advisories and bulletins, which you can receive by text or email for the regions in, of interest to you. That's on the left hand side. If you live in the Lower Mainland, uh, it is Metro Vancouver who would communicate that type of information and um, they do that by email. So there's sort of different systems depending on where you live in the province and that's because there's different air quality regulators in different parts of the province. 
I'm a huge fan of the AQHI smartphone application. We've done some work on the AQHI in BC to make sure that it works really nicely during wildfire season. So it's a good source of information and um, you can choose the level at which you want to be alerted and the places you want to be alerted for so that when air quality starts to degrade in those areas, you know very quickly. This is my settings on the right hand side. I follow all of the stations in BC and I want to know if they reach a level of seven. The WeatherCan app will likely consume the AQHI app in due time. I believe that's the intention of Environment and Climate Change Canada. We're not quite there yet, but the WeatherCan app does provide um, AQHI values and they have this other alerting feature. So if you use this app for um, other stuff, you'll get these, you know, winter weather warning alerts and they do you know, alert quite aggressively, that will happen for air quality as well. So we're kind of transitioning towards this app over time, and it's a really good useful app. I am a huge fan of smoke forecasts. I'm just going to play this for you. This is uh, 2017. You can see we had smoke right across the province. And then this forecast is showing the weather pattern changing and it just lifting right out. And honestly, that forecast was almost dead accurate. So these forecasts are now available 72 hours in advance. So we try to model what's going to happen with smoke for the next three days. And it's one of the best sources of information on what you can expect over the coming days. However, it's not in the most useful format for most users. So we take it at the BC CDC and integrate it into something we call the BC asthma prediction system. We average those values down for today and tomorrow, and we're just adding the next day now. Um, and we have this nice search feature, so you can search where you are and see what the smoke is likely to be exactly in your region. And then we also make predictions about what the health effects of that smoke are gonna be based on the concentrations and what we know of the susceptibility of the population in the area. <sighs> Finally, one of the big questions for us has been like, well, we've done all this work to try to get the BC population ready for smoke and thinking about smoke and protecting themselves. Is it working? And a huge shout out to the Legacy for Airway Health who were able to administer a survey on this topic last year in partnership with a bunch of agencies and um, patient groups across the province. And we got some really good information on this. So first of all, were you aware of wildfire smoke messages? Yes, most people were. Uh, varied a little bit by financial demographics here, but in general, a lot of people were aware of these messages. So that doesn't mean we give up or we stop talking about it, but it's really good to know that the messages are getting out there. We found that 90% of people took action on the messages in really different ways. So people, I assume, take the actions that work for them and make most sense to them, but everybody or almost everybody took some kind of action to protect themselves. So that's a great foundation for us to work on. Uh, we have indication that people do want to protect themselves and that they want information with which to protect themselves. We did find that understanding of the information provided differed across groups. Uh, here it is by income level. And there was, you know, express um, desire that messages be made simpler, uh, that more information be provided in online forums, if that's the correct way to get it. And um, I didn't put this slide in. We also found that we, we got to hit every kind of channel of communication. Folks get their information from social media, from the internet, from the television, from the radio. We really found that radio was important for a few key groups, um, particularly Indigenous populations, um, people working in the trades, and people living in smaller communities. We know that you know cell coverage isn't great across all of BC, so that idea that we you know we got to focus on local radio as well is is an important outcome for those of us who try to get these messages out. So I'm going to end with a few simple messages for you. First, think about smoke before it arrives. Second, plan to shelter in place at home. It's great to seek cleaner air within the community for sure, but you're gonna 
spend most of your time at home. And if you can protect yourself in your home, that's going to be the biggest possible win. Air cleaners and box fan filters work. They need to be the right size for the place they're working in, but they do work. Big buildings need customized plans. I can't make a customized plan for you. That's just something that building operators need to work through. Air's gotta go through the mask, not around it. Look to the BCCDC for information. Um, we do chair a provincial group on wildfire smoke and health. It has representation from a large number of agencies. It is generally decided that the BCCDC should be the voice of truth on this issue. And uh, if information you need isn't there, we will try to get it for you. And then communicate about smoke through all available channels. We wanna hit everybody uh, who's listening. Um, Mike, uh, I think has provided the link to this. It's a, a piece that came out in the conversation and it's really just kind of practical steps for individuals to take to prepare for the wildfire season ahead. Um, those folks who should be talking to their healthcare professionals about certain things, um, just, just kind of getting folks thinking about this. And then uh, I really wrote that because last year in the midst of wild smart smoke, the conversation asked me to write this piece, which I did, which is kind of too, Tip, tools and trips for oh, tools and tips for coping with smoke when it's actually there. Um, so together, I think these two provide you know kind of really nice resources to bookmark for for folks. And that is all I have, and I think we've left significant time for questions. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Wonderful talk. And as uh, as Sarah mentioned, we'll open it up for um, questions. Again, please put them in the Q and A. Um, and uh, there's a few coming in. Um, so let me just uh, have you take the first one because it's very specific. Is there any data on wildfire smoke impacts um, on uh, people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, there's no specific evidence. Um, but I wouldn't, ex you know, anybody with a pre-existing respiratory condition that affects their ability to breathe on a daily basis, I am going to expect that smoke is hard on those people. So I would say anybody with high IPF should be um, protecting themselves from smoke as much as possible. Great. Thank you. And then the next question is, um, is for individuals working in the fire service. Um, what kind of input or guidance uh, can, I guess we collectively um, offer to the, the fire service uh, industry to improve their safety on the front lines? So a little bit of different from the, the topic of your presentation, I think also very useful information. Yeah, this is a really tough one. Um, there's a few things going on here. First of all, it's difficult for wildland firefighters to wear a respiratory protection that allows them to do their work well. Uh, second of all, there's sort of the perception that wildland firefighters are young, healthy people and can probably tolerate smoke exposures more than you know the general population. Third of all, um, there's a lot of evidence from structural firefighters indicating that smoke exposures to smoke from structural fires is deleterious to their health in the long term. And all, all these things are kind of coming together right now. So I would say we're in a position where there's a lot more research happening on wildland firefighters. There's a lot of thought going into what kind of respiratory protection might work for them. Um, new methods, new materials. Um, there's also looking at um, pharmaceutical interventions for this population. So, you know, are there, if they take anti-inflammatories while they're working, does that help to protect them from the smoke? We know that one of the mechanisms of smoke exposure damage is through inflammation. We um, work closely with the wildfire service as part of the provincial group. We also work closely with WorkSafe as part of the provincial group. But what it really comes down to is um, occupational health isn't 
isn't my area of expertise and you know i'm not i wouldn't make recommendations for occupational environments because that's that's not what i do so the best answer i can give you is that a lot of folks are thinking about it it's a really important topic and i think we're going to see a lot of progress in the next five years based on everything that i've heard so next question is what's our understanding of acute effects on uh largely healthy adults <laughs> Um, there's a couple of, you know, my, my take on this is, you know, when you're exposed to smoke, there's always likely some subclinical impact, um, whether or not that plays out in something that you can feel or symptoms is going to be a very individual thing. In general, uh, for healthy folks who are not too bothered by smoky conditions when they occur, um, you know, we, we tell people, listen to your body. Uh, if your body is telling you that it's struggling with this, respect your body and uh, protect yourself. If you're I love people to protect themselves anyways, just out of the precautionary principle. But if you find the smoke doesn't get to you too much, then the smoke doesn't get to you too much. And we aren't seeing, you know, huge evidence of huge impacts in healthy populations. But to be honest, there hasn't been that much work um, looking for those types of impacts either. You know, we, a lot of the work that we do in smoke exposure epidemiology, we're looking at administrative health data sets. So ambulance dispatches, ER visits, hospital admissions, physician visits, so those things that get into the data because then we can measure them. There's not too much out there on the symptoms that people have or on you know markers of inflammation in the blood. Those studies don't get done as much. And next question, actually, one that um, I'm going to broaden. The, the question is, can municipalities help? And I'm just going to broaden it if you can speak a little bit about sort of longer term planning. I think you've, you've talked mostly about kind of what can we do this season, but thinking about this, this being now annual or the expectation that, that really we should be thinking about this every year and not, uh, you know, we'll get lucky if we don't get a, a, a fire wildfire smoke event, um, municipalities, health authorities, the province, uh, let's say building managers uh, in general, um, kind of institutionally, um, what about longer term planning? What, what would you like to see? And, and you know, how can municipalities, I guess, help specifically? Right, so as I kind of alluded to in the talk, I would love to see a world where every large building has its smoke readiness plan. Uh, much the same way we've had COVID-19 safety plans for how COVID is going to be managed in certain areas. I'd love to see a smoke readiness plan so that when wildfire season comes, uh, the managers of that building pull out the smoke readiness plan, review it, make sure the building's ready to go. And then there's certain steps that get thrown into action uh, when smoke is expected or um, imminent, I guess. So that's the ideal for me for existing buildings and those readiness plans um, have quite a few elements to them. That document I referenced from ASHRAE really lays out those elements nicely, but they're looking at the HVAC system, seeing how much of the smoke your HVAC will be able to get out for you, depending on the type of filters that it can handle, looking at entrances and exits to the building and restricting them when it gets smoky. That's probably the biggest lesson that we learned from that GF Strong research. Usually there's eight entrances to GF Strong. They were restricted to two because of the COVID safety plan. And that probably really helped to protect the building from smoke coming in. And then looking at those areas where localized air cleaning is, is recommended or necessary to reduce indoor concentration. So there's kind of these, these three elements. And then a fourth element that's, you know, I think getting more and more achievable all the time is actually measuring it. Uh, you know, we have these low cost sensors for PM 2.5. They do pretty well. You got one outside, you got one inside. You got a lot of information on how well your smoke management plan is working and you're able to taper it and adapt it if things aren't going well. So that kind of availability of measurement is, I think, going to be huge in the years ahead. 
more broadly, that's again, kind of for existing building stock, more broadly, I think we really need to start looking at building codes and smoke readiness in building codes. This is not a problem that's going away anytime soon. Um, we're likely to be into a future with more fire in Western North America, especially for some time. So how do we ensure that we're building buildings so that we can safely exclude smoke when it occurs? And I say safely exclude smoke because we also know from the pandemic that we got to be able to ventilate well with fresh air or if there is some sort of pandemic virus happening, um, we may uh, have difficulty with virus buildup um, in, in the air and in closed places. So, you know, just we need some big picture thinking about what the future of the built environment looks like. So next um, question is related to indoor air filters. Um, and it, in one of the slides, it appeared that filters had little or no effect at reducing PM 2.5 in some situations, but were quite effective in others. Any idea why the difference? Probably just how the building was being used at that time. You know, were windows open, were kids coming and going a lot and opening the door and closing the door. I, you know, it's hard and there is some commentary in Dr. Barnes' work kind of about the things that were possibly driving these differences, but it's going to be, again, it's just going to be individual by individual building use case. Um, a question on any evidence of, of those affected and have recovered from COVID and their susceptibility to air quality issues, wildfire smoke uh, going forward um, in general, anything about vaccines and susceptibility any, any comments you might have realizing this? I think so we're probably early. too early in the evidence to talk about any of that. There's quite a lot of work related to air pollution exposure and potential impacts on COVID susceptibility and COVID um, severity. I haven't seen very much at all on uh, folks who've recovered from COVID and their potential susceptibility post recovery to air quality. But I will do a little bit of a plug for my agency here and some of the folks who work here, because one of the first things they got set up when uh, we came into the pandemic was something called the British Columbia COVID-19 cohort, where we are able to uh, link folks who've been tested for COVID with other um, administrative health data, all in an extremely anonymized way, but then we can better understand what the longer term effects for people who have had COVID are, if any, um, and air quality can be part of that. So, you know, at this, this point, there's some more immediate work happening with the cohort, but that cohort will help us to address questions about the longer term health impacts of COVID for in the years ahead. And the next question is, what precautions can workers in vehicles take? To hmm. exposure? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, you know, the, the advice we typically give is to roll up the windows, put the air on, recirculate, let it go through the filter. Health Canada has actually done some work to show that that may not work and it may make things worse in some cases, depending on what's going on with the filter and the car. Um, so, you know, um, it's also problematic from a COVID perspective if you're traveling in a vehicle um, and trying to keep windows open and the vehicle well ventilated. So at this point, I would say like, do what seems reasonable. Um, wearing a respirator while driving may be an option, although we obviously don't want people driving if they can't see well while wearing a respirator. Um, if it seems like having the windows rolled up and the air conditioning on and the recirculate on is keeping smoke out of the vehicle, then it's probably keeping smoke out of the vehicle. But if you find that it's getting smokier in the vehicle than outdoors, you, know, you just have to kind of do what seems to be working for you. I can't give super specific advice based on what I know of the evidence. 
And I'll, I'll just jump in a little bit. There's, there's been some work on this, um, for example, in India and other countries where this is more of a, a chronic issue, high episode. So a couple other sort of technical things. There are uh, portable air filters. So air cleaners that you can put inside a vehicle and operate. Um, there's also higher quality air intake filters that you can put into a vehicle as well. But the, the general, as, as Dr. Henderson mentioned, operating on recirculation with the windows closed um, will reduce exposure. One caveat to that, however, especially if there are multiple people in the car, is that the carbon dioxide that you exhale can then build up to rather high concentrations and which could actually affect your performance uh, in terms of driving. So you're, the safety of driving. So the general recommendation is if you do have the vehicle closed up tightly, to reduce the intake of smoke, to actually open up the windows for um, 30 seconds or so every 15 minutes or so, especially if, if you are driving uh, at, at the time. So it's a bit of a, a complicated issue. Um, we'll take uh, yeah another question, perhaps a complicated one. This is the AQHI, which is based on measures of several constituents of air pollution, not just PM2.5. Uh, in communities where only uh, uh, PM2.5 is monitored, is there any way to compute values to include those communities in the AQHI reporting? And yes, I know you're happy to answer. I'm, I love this question. I'm so excited. Okay, so first of all, um, the AQHI as it was originally designed is a three pollutant three hour running average. We recently changed it in BC so that when PM2.5 is dominating the air quality mixture, um, we base the AQHI on PM 2.5 one hour averages only. So we have this kind of hybrid HQH, AQHI plus for British Columbia. Now, the question you're asking is, well, what if the station only monitors PM 2.5? We've certainly had quite a few conversations about that at the provincial table. There, it's a complicated question for sure. I mean, there's just a lot of kind of um, thought that needs to go into something like this, but we are having those conversations. And then we recently proposed some work to actually kind of make a province-wide AQHI estimate similar to that, um, that smoke forecast I was showing you that kind of covers the whole province. We're looking at blending different types of data, especially in the wildfire season to say, we don't actually know what the AQHI is here because we're not measuring it, but we're pretty sure that it's probably this or in this range. Just to provide that level of information because there's so many small communities in BC who don't have any air quality monitoring or don't have the full suite of AQHI instruments but could really benefit from AQHI type information. So I don't have a great, yes, it's gonna happen answer for you, but I do have a, like, we're having really enthusiastic conversations about this. And I think we will, you know, see something in the next couple of years for communities that don't have the full three pollutant measurements. Okay, I think we'll take the last question and then we'll uh, close uh, the webinar for today. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually restrict the question. The question is about how big is the problem uh, regarding smoke from campfires. And um, the question also asks about heating appliances. But I think we've had um, multiple other webinars and educational information that you can find on the DC Long website about about home heating. But what about campfires? So what smoke isn't good for you? Again, it's a very personal response. If you feel that the smoke is making you feel unwell, then protect yourself from the smoke. Uh, folks love campfires. I love campfires. Um, I think campfires become problematic when the smoke that they're generating uh, is affecting other people who aren't participating in the campfire. We're not allowed to smoke in public places and blow cigarette smoke on people. So I think, you know, if you're going to have campfires, we should be having them in a way that's respectful to other people who um, may have those exposures. Campfires are also, you know, really spatially limited uh, compared with wildfire smoke. Wildfire smoke affects millions and millions of people sometimes. Um, campfire impacts are much smaller. And I will just uh, have a plug for safe campfires that do not start wildfires because that's the worst kind of campfire for sure. So again, like campfire smoke's not great for you. 
it's really enjoyable in social and other ways. Uh, there's there's trade-offs there, but if smoke is you know really affecting other people, then I think we need to consider uh, where those campfires are happening and and what the recommendations may be. Okay, so um, thanks very much. I think with that we will close the webinar for today. I'd like to. Um, uh, uh, ask all of you to join me in virtual round of applause uh, for Dr. Henderson for a really excellent presentation. Um, and thanks so much for imparting all this uh, very timely and, and relevant information to all, to all of us. Um, reminder that the webinar has been recorded. I would like to also thank uh, the BC Lung Association for uh, hosting the webinar and putting it on. And thanks all of you for your participation and your questions. I think it was a really good dialogue. And I'll turn it to you, Chris, for just some final words. Absolutely, thank you. And I wanna echo uh, that thanks to uh, Dr. Sarah Henderson and, and Dr. Brower as well for moderating an, an excellent, excellent session. I think we learned a lot and uh, I wanna emphasize that a lot of that information uh, will be made available uh, on our website. And if you want some further information, two excellent sources that were discussed. One is that article written by Dr. Sarah Henderson that's on the conversation that was shared earlier. And as well as Dr. Henderson mentioned on the BC CDC website, uh, up-to-date information as it comes. Uh, so thank you for everyone for working on that. I also wanted to mention uh, that in two weeks time, the BC Lung Association State of the Air Report will be coming out. Uh, basically the uh, uh, the tips, the tricks, and, and the scorecard on air quality in British Columbia. Uh, a shout out as well to the Caring for the Air Report by Metro Vancouver, if you live in that area. I know it's an anniversary year for them, and uh, that'll be an important publication uh, for that region as it comes out. Uh, just in closing, I, I wanted to harken back to the beginning of this, um, uh, Dr. Henderson sharing with us her her scouts badge, uh, you know, be prepared, uh, zombie or not. I think that's an excellent message. Uh, takeaway really here is make a plan and be prepared. Uh, if we are going to have to stay in place, make sure you're prepared for that. So uh, thank you to everyone who was involved, all the partners who made this all happen and contributed in some fashion, uh, BC Lung, Legacy for Airway Health, UBC, and of course the BC CDC. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us. And uh, enjoy Clean Air Day as it hopefully it was meant to be. Get out there and enjoy it. Uh, and please do it safely and considerate of everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.